Hello, I'm Brian Weiner, a professor in the departments of global health and health services at the University of Washington. It's my pleasure to talk with you about measurement and implementation science. Regardless of the field of study, measurement is one of the most challenging components of research design and simultaneously one of the most important given that science is measurement. With implementation science in its adolescence, the field is beset by measurement issues that stunt the growth of its advancing knowledge base. In order to confidently test hypotheses, implementation scientists must hone in on key constructs for evaluation and then identify existing measures that exhibit strong psychometric properties and are feasible and appropriate to the context. So over the next 20 minutes or so, I'd like to talk about measurement. Specifically, I'd like to refresh your memory about desirable properties of measures, discuss instrumentation issues in implementation science, survey the state of measurement in the field, and discuss the applicability of IS measures for use in low and middle income contexts. Now, before we look at the state of measurement in the field of implementation science, let's talk about what makes a measure a good measure. What is it that we want in measures? We want three things. We want them to be reliable, valid, and practical. Reliability concerns the quality of measurement, the quality of assessment. In its everyday sense, reliability is about the consistency or the repeatability of your measures. Think about stepping on and off a scale or using a ruler. There are several forms of reliability, including inter-rater or inter-observer reliability, test-retest reliability, parallel forms reliability, and internal consistency. Internal consistency is the most common commonly assessed form of reliability, often through the computation of Conback Alpha, but other forms of reliability are also important in implementation science. For example, if we are using an observational tool to assess fidelity of intervention delivery, or even fidelity of implementation strategy enactment, then inter-rater or inter-observer reliability becomes very important. We also want measures to be valid. Validity concerns the accuracy of an assessment. In its everyday sense, validity is about whether your measure measures what it is purporting or intending to measure. At one time, measurement experts talked about different types of validity, but nowadays measurement experts say there is only one type of validity, construct validity. Construct validity, simply put, is an assessment of whether the measure, in fact, measures the construct that you think it's measuring. The lists that you see here are not different types of validity, therefore, but rather different forms of evidence for construct validity. We want measures to be reliable and valid, that's true, but we also want them to be practical or pragmatic. That is, we want them to be useful and easy to use. A practical or pragmatic measure is one that measures something that's important to stakeholders, that imposes low burden on respondents or staff, that can be acted upon, and that can tell us when something has changed. An aspiration for implementation science is that practitioners will use measures to assess their local implementation contexts, monitor their implementation efforts, and evaluate their implementation outcomes or their success. However, practitioners will not use measures if they are not practical, no matter how reliable or valid they might be. Researchers too care about practicality. Our research suffers when practitioners perceive the measures that we use to be irrelevant or burdensome, for example, resulting in low response rates or uh, low quality data. There are other qualities that make a measure practical, but these four qualities represent a good starting list. In implementation science, the constructs that interest us fall into three categories, determinants, processes, and outcomes. I've listed here some conceptual frameworks commonly used to get at these three categories. The SIC is the stages of implementation completion, which might not be as familiar as the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, or REAIM, for example. But it is one of the few frameworks and measures that we have in the field for assessing the process of implementation. I've also listed several constructs from these frameworks. Note that there are two types of constructs here. Manifest constructs, that is, things that we can directly observe, and these are indicated in red font, and latent constructs. These are things that we can't directly observe, but we think exist. And in fact, not just exist, but actually cause what we can see or observe. There are several common measurement challenges for both manifest and latent constructs, but there are several distinct measurement challenges for latent constructs. And this is particularly important for implementation science, as many of the constructs that we care about cannot be directly observed. Take a look at this list. Instead, we can only infer their existence and strength by measuring measuring indicators 
that reflect their presence and their operation. When we measure latent constructs, we look for their hidden but causal effect on these observable indicators, often variables or items in a scale. But this indirect method of measuring latent constructs gives rise to a fundamental concern. Are we in fact measuring what we think we're measuring and how do we know whether or not we are? So what can we say then about the state of measurement in the field of implementation science? Well, I've had the privilege of participating in the instrument review project, an effort led by Kara Lewis and funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. And through this project, we have reviewed hundreds of measures used in mental health and behavioral health care to capture implementation context, processes, and outcomes. I have more to say about the instrument review project in a few minutes, but here I will summarize our observations of the state of measurement of the field of implementation science. In the process of reviewing these hundreds of measures, we observed the following instrumentation issues. First, measures are poorly distributed across the constructs of interest in implementation science. For some constructs, we have dozens of measures, and for others, we have only a few or none at all. Second, many measures have unknown or dubious psychometric quality. Few measures in our field have undergone a systematic development and testing process. As such, their psychometric properties remain largely unknown, unexplored. Often, there is limited information about the reliability or validity of these measures, and the information that we do have often suggests low or modest levels of each. In part, this problem arises because many measures are used once and never again. The proliferation of single-use measures is itself a problem for the field, but it also contributes to this problem of limited information about reliability and validity. Third, measures exhibit synonymy, homonymy, and instability. Try saying that three times fast. That is, we see the same items being used to measure different constructs, different items used to measure the same construct, and changes to items with each use of a measure. For example, the range of items used to measure organizational readiness for change is breathtaking. Often, there is very little overlap in item content between two measures of, quote, organizational readiness. Not only that, the items used to measure organizational readiness are often also used to measure other constructs like organizational culture or management support. And it is very tempting, and it often occurs, for researchers to add, drop, or modify items in a measure to make it more specific or more tailored to their research study. These three problems raise serious doubts about the construct validity of our measures. Simply put, we can't be sure that we are in fact measuring what we think we're measuring. Fourth, many measures are not practical. Implementation scientists have not prioritized practicality in measurement, and as a result, our measures are often too long and too complicated for practitioners to use. And finally, as a sidebar, the psychometric properties of our measures are often poorly reported in our peer-reviewed articles, and the measures themselves are hard to find because they are not well indexed in bibliographic databases like PubMed. This makes it hard to find the reliable, valid, pragmatic measures that do exist. Those are some pretty bold claims, I know, so let me bring the receipts. I'll start with a measure review that Karen Emmons and her colleagues published in 2012. They identified and evaluated 30 36 measures spanning constructs of leadership, vision, managerial relations, organizational climate, and absorptive capacity. These constructs are all located in the system readiness domain of Trish Greenhall's uh, implementation framework. Only the measures of leadership and organizational climate demonstrated some evidence of both reliability and validity. Across all five constructs, the authors found that no measure was used in more than one study. Most studies did not include reports of the measure's psychometric properties so information wasn't even reported or available. Some were based on a single response per unit, which is problematic for certain constructs like organizational culture and climate, where really you need to have multiple responses per organizational unit to really gauge what the culture or the climate of that organization is. And finally, the levels of the measure and the levels of analysis were not always compatible. And again, for certain constructs, this is also problematic. Given these four issues, the authors noted that they were unable to offer any recommendations for using Using the identified measures to evaluate any of the five constructs in the review. In 2013, Chaudoir and her colleagues published a review of measures of factors affecting the implementation of health innovations. They identified 62 measures of constructs within the organization, provider, innovation, structural, and patient level domains. 
their item level analysis of psychometrics centered only on predictive validity. They didn't look at reliability or any other evidence of construct validity. Their review revealed that almost half of the identified measures did not include an assessment of predictive validity in either their original validation studies where this measure was developed or in any subsequent study where the measure was used. Of the measures that did assess predictive validity, adoption and fidelity were the only implementation outcomes examined. Their review also uncovered that the constructs at the level of the organization, provider, and innovation had the greatest number of measures, while constructs at the structural and patient level were less saturated with measures. Remember what I said earlier about measures being poorly distributed across the constructs that we care about in implementation science? It turns out that they're also poorly distributed across the levels of analysis that we care about. Additionally, of the 62 measures identified in their review, 21 only had one citation associated with them. Again, there are lots of single-use measures out there. Moving along, Chor and her colleagues identified 118 measures that assessed 27 predictors of adoption. They found that measures were unevenly distributed across the predictors, with external environment constructs having the most measures and social network constructs having the fewest. The authors observed multiple definitions of a single predictor in addition to multiple forms of measures or measurement. There's that synonymy and homonymy problem that I mentioned earlier. With respect to the psychometric properties of the 118 measures, only 62 or about half reported any evidence of reliability or validity. That's right. Only half of these measures even reported any evidence of reliability and validity. And note, these authors were simply indicating in this review whether or not there was any information about reliability or validity reported, even for those measures where there was some evidence of reliability or validity reported, these authors did not delve into the level or the strength of that evidence for reliability or validity, just whether or not it was in the report. Finally, I have mentioned already the Instrument Review Project. This project identified and reviewed the psychometric properties of more than 420 measures used in mental and behavioral health care. The project is guided by the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research and Enola Proctor's Implementation Outcomes Framework. As I've already mentioned, we observed great variability in the number of measures distributed across the constructs in the Consolidated Framework. For example, within the CIFR domain characteristics of individuals, there were 50 56 measures for the knowledge and beliefs construct alone, just that one construct. By comparison, the Seaver domain outer setting contained only four measures for the four constructs in that domain. And for two of those constructs in that domain, external policy and incentives and peer pressure, there were no measures. With respect to Nola Proctor's implementation outcomes framework, we identified 104 measures unevenly distributed across the eight implementation outcomes in her framework. The construct of acceptability had by far the greatest number of measures about half if I recall correctly. Only one of the 104 measures reviewed had information available for all eight of the psychometric and pragmatic properties that we examined. Those properties included internal consistency, structural validity, predictive validity, norms, responsiveness and usability, among others. Unlike the previous reviews that I've mentioned, here we went beyond simply assessing whether or not there was any information about the psychometric or pragmatic properties in the articles, and instead actually rated the strength of that psychometric evidence or pragmatic evidence using four-point rating scales tailored to each psychometric and pragmatic property. Across all 104 instruments, only half were rated good or excellent for reliability. About 17% were rated good or excellent for structural validity, 9% were rated good or excellent for predictive validity, about half were rated good or excellent for norms, but only 2% were rated good or excellent for responsiveness. Although the state of measurement in the field of implementation science could, let's say, use some improvement, I don't want to leave you with the impression that there are no good measures out there. This is just a partial list of measures that have strong psychometric and pragmatic properties. Let me also point you to work that Maria Fernandez, Michelle Kegler, and others involved in the Cancer Prevention and Control Research Network have produced. They have generated a series of measures of intersetting constructs and tested them in the context of colorectal cancer screening in community health centers. This is a promising start. Clearly, more work needs to be done, but we are moving in the right direction. Let me also say that we can take matters into our own hands and produce reliable, valid, pragmatic measures and in doing so, strengthen the measurement foundation of the field. There are established processes for developing and testing new measures, and although time-consuming, these processes can be completed on an accelerated timetable. For example, over the course of 18 months, my colleagues and I developed and tested new measures of three implementation outcomes. 
acceptability, appropriateness, and feasibility. We picked these three implementation outcomes because there were few reliable, valid, and pragmatic measures available based on our instrument review project work. We began with domain delineation, whereby one develops a conceptual definition of a construct and then builds what's called a nomological network that situates that construct in a set of theoretical relationships with its determinants, its outcomes, and related constructs. This step is super important because theory and measurement go hand in hand, especially for latent constructs that we think exist but we can't directly observe. We then put the measures through a systematic process of psychometric evaluation and measure refinement. Briefly, we conducted three experimental studies involving some implementation scientists, but mostly involving practicing mental health professionals. We then conducted a field study to assess the psychometric properties in real-world implementation, including an assessment of predictive validity. I won't go into detail about the studies that we conducted. Instead, I'm going to highlight what we accomplished. Using a rapid cycle process of measure development and testing, we produced measures of acceptability, appropriate and feasibility that possessed several desirable psychometric properties, including content validity, discriminant content validity, internal consistency, test-retest reliability, structural validity, structural invariance, known groups validity, and responsiveness to change. Although these implementation outcomes are important in their own right as implementation outcomes, they are, at least hypothetically, linked to other implementation outcomes like adoption. Although we have tested the predictive validity of these measures, we have not yet demonstrated their predictive validity, in part because I don't think we had the right study conditions to really demonstrate that relationship. Some important features of these three measures are worth noting. First, they directly measure the construct of interest, not proxies like upstream determinants. Second, they show discriminant content validity, meaning our measure of acceptability, for example, measures acceptability only and does not measure appropriateness or feasibility. There's very little item overlap or conflict. Third, they can be used to assess the acceptability, appropriateness, and feasibility of evidence-based practices, implementation strategies, or both. Fourth, the items can be tailored somewhat without changing the measure's psychometric properties. And finally, they are each only four items long, making them practical for use in real-world settings. There is a real hunger out there for reliable, valid, pragmatic measures in implementation science. Although the article on our implementation outcomes measures was published only in August of 2017, it has been viewed more than 20,000 times and cited more than 130 times. Importantly, the measures have been translated into 10 languages, and 61 scholars from 20 countries have informed us that they plan to use our measures. So this brings up the important topic of adapting measures that were developed in high-income countries for use in low- or middle-income countries. I'd like to mention four important considerations. The first is that translating measures from English into new languages is tricky. Best practice dictates that fluent language users engage in translation and back translation, as well as cognitive interviewing to ensure that the measures still mean what they mean in the original language. This is especially tricky given the subtle differences in meaning of words in different languages languages. So the translation cannot be literal in most instances. Instead, the translated measure should read as though it were written originally in that language. Further, the psychometric properties of the translated measure have to be examined anew. There is no guarantee that the translated measure will have the same psychometric properties as the original. It's also important to recognize that response biases vary across cultures. Social desirability, for example, manifests in myriad ways and is heavily influenced by culture. Finally, the conceptual meaning of constructs can differ substantially across cultures and countries. In work that I'm doing with my colleagues in global health, for example, we are learning that organizational readiness for change means something different in, say, South Africa or Kenya than it does in the United States of America. We have a culture here that prizes individualism and independence. We have a health system that is decentralized, fragmented, and privatized in all kinds of strange ways. We have a healthcare workforce that, relatively speaking, enjoys a high degree of professional autonomy. All of these cultural and health system factors shape what organizational readiness means, what predicts or increases organizational readiness, and what results when organizational readiness is high or low. Let me just conclude with five takeaways. First, better measures are needed in implementation science. If we don't develop a stronger measurement foundation, we risk building this beautiful house we call implementation science on shifting and unstable sound. Second, poor measurement practices unfortunately abound in implementation science. We need researchers who develop measures to follow best practices in doing so. And we need 
researchers to become better users of measures. There is widespread misuse of Cronbach Alpha, just to give an example. Thirdly, we need more attention to theory in measurement. Theory and measurement go hand in hand, as I said earlier. Theory plays a particularly critical role in defining latent constructs and differentiating the constructs of interest from other constructs that are related, causally or semantically. Fourth, rapid cycle development and testing is possible. We were able to accomplish quite a bit in the 18 months that we used the rapid cycle development and testing process, as I've already mentioned. And finally, cultural adaptation is essential as implementation science crosses countries and cultures. Thank you.